Can Quentin and I met um, through a friend of ours, Scott Spiegel. I had produced this little movie with Scott. It was my first movie. It was called Intruder. Sam Raimi was in it. And the whole thing took place in the grocery store. And it was really funny because, you know, I was trying to be a producer and I read the screenplay, True Romance, which I loved. And, um, and Scott introduced me to him. Uh, I met Quentin at, at Scott's house. Uh, I think it was like a 4th of July party. And I go, oh, Quentin Tarantino. I've, I've read a script by a name very similar to that called True Romance. He goes, that's me. <laughs> I go, I don't think so. And it, he goes, no, 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 that was me. I go, really? I love, I couldn't, I, he was trying to convince me that he actually had written the script. <laughs> and uh, I loved, I said, I loved that script. It was fantastic. And he had Natural Born Killers already at that point written that. But he was getting tired of trying to get that made. Um, and so he said, I'm going to write this script, uh, Reservoir Dogs. And it's about a bunch of guys that do a jewelry heist. And it all takes place like in a garage or someplace where they all come back afterwards. And uh, he was actually intending it originally to, for everyone to get away. And um, of course, that doesn't quite happen. Um, which is one of the things that's great about the way Quentin writes is that he starts off with this intention and he creates these characters. But then the characters write the movie in a sense. He, he is in a sense God, but he's infused these characters with this ethos and they end up walking through this world and create this world. Um, and at the end of the movie, they created a different scenario than he had kind of started out with. Originally, Reservoir Dogs was going to be shot for like 30,000 bucks. Quentin was going to do it with just him and a bunch of his friends. He said, you know, we'll do it in black and white, 16 millimeter. I'll play Mr. Pink. You know, you'll play one of the characters. And, and I read the script and go, this is just, it's better than that. You need to let me go out and raise some money. And he says, I don't want to wait. I'm a director who has not directed, therefore I don't exist. And I'm not going to wait. I'm not going to wait years to raise money. Meanwhile, my friend Chris Brancato, who's a big TV showrunner now, he was a good friend of mine and a young writer, and his roommate was Lawrence Bender. Lawrence Bender was PAing on another one of their friend's music videos, and I knew Lawrence a little bit also. And when I first started working at Jersey Films, I would always comb through the films in pre-production chart. And, uh, and I'd always see if there were really good actors working with directors I had never heard of. And so then I would get the scripts and I would do the research. And there was the script, Reservoir Dogs, and it had all these amazing actors in it. So I got my hands on the script and I read it. And then I started calling. Um, it was actually Scott Zimmerman at William Morris, I think his name was. And he was Quentin's original agent before Mike Simpson. Mike came on board in the process. And Lee Stolman, who was working for this guy, Scott, read it and said, this is really great. And he got Mike involved, and Mike became Quentin's agent. You know, the script had started to make the rounds around town. And we were, uh, we were really focusing on the independent market at that time. And uh, one of the guys came in and told me, hey, this script, I read it. It's just really amazing. You've got to cancel whatever you're doing tonight because uh, this guy's coming in tomorrow to have a casting meeting. You got to read it. I said, "Well, I've got to do this, that, and the other." He goes, no, "Really, it's really, really good." And I said, "You're sure?" He goes, "Yeah." I go, "I said, okay." So I canceled whatever I was going to do, and I stayed home and read it that night. And sure enough, it was like you know one of the best scripts I'd ever read. Maybe at that time, it was the best script I'd ever read. I remember reading the script for the first time, and it's so funny because. Every script I've read of Quentin subsequently, I've had almost the identical reaction. But I sat in my office and I was reading the opening scene when they're in their diner and they're doing the Madonna dialogue and the dick, dick, dick and all that stuff. And I remember calling Howard and Bob into my office and saying, I've never read anything like this in my life. I, it's the first time I'm reading characters talking and each one of them has a voice. And, it, and I believe everything that I read on the page that he had written. And so often when you read scripts, you have to put a face to that voice. And what I loved about his writing was he, he put that face in your head. Mm -hmm. um, and I just remember reading it and just going, oh my God, I've, I've never read anything like this. It was just, it blew me away. The other thing about, um, about Quentin and, and the world of home video at the time, you know, part of how Lawrence ended up in, 
his partnership with Quentin was that he knew Harvey Keitel's acting coach. And there was a home video company that Richard Gladstein worked for, Live Entertainment. If you had Harvey Keitel, you got $1.5 million to make your movie. And since Lawrence knew somebody who knew Harvey, he said, just give me a month, because Quentin had been burned by all the permutations of when he was gonna direct True Romance, when he wasn't. So basically, Lawrence said, please give me 30 days. We're making Reservoir Dogs. I'm still in acting class, and I'm a PA on movie sets and commercials to make money. And my acting teacher said, um, out of anyone in the world, who do you want to be in this movie? And Quentin and I had talked about this quite a bit, and Harvey Keitel was our dream. So Peter Flood was my acting teacher at the time. His wife was also an acting teacher, Lily Parker. Lily was a member of the actor's studio. And Lily gave the script to Harvey Keitel. And I'll never forget, I was at my girlfriend's house at the time. And uh, I checked my messages on my machine. And I get a message from Harvey Keitel. And it's like this life-changing message that I, I will never forget. And I just, I, when I, I, I just want to shoot myself that I didn't save this message. But um, like, hi, Lawrence, it's Harvey Keitel calling. Uh, I just read this script, Reservoir Dogs. And um, this fellow, Quentin Tarantino, is really talented. And I'd love to help in any way I can. Please give me a call. It was like my dreams were coming, about to come true in this just, just paradigm shift kind of phone call. So um, we all went over to his house, Quentin and Richard Gladstein and myself, and Harvey Keitel is bringing us out espressos. <laughs> You're like, wait a minute, we're in a movie. <laughs> Harvey Keitel is bringing us an espresso. I felt like I was in one of the movies that Harvey was in. Um, and uh, so, yes, yeah, so, so Harvey became attached to the movie. Um, and that was the thing that, was, that enabled us to actually green light the movie. Harvey attached to the budget that we were at, enabled us to green light the movie. Keitel was godfather the minute that I got the script. And one of the reasons why I read it was Harvey Keitel wants to be in this movie. I first read the script of Reservoir Dogs when uh, Monty Hellman uh, sent it to me. I had made a film with Monty years before. Monty called me up and said, I have the script for you to read. I said, I assume you want to direct it. He said, I would love to, but there's this kid who wrote it who's going to direct it. And for some reason, Monty dropped the script off at my house. And I worked at Live Entertainment, a home video company. I, for some reason, on my way into my house, I opened up the thing, I started reading it, and there's no description of the characters whatsoever. It just says, five guys, black suits, sit around a diner, and then the dialogue starts. And I just started reading it, and I was immediately just completely freaked out by it and loved it. And I remember halfway through I stopped because I said, there's no way it's going to be able to sustain. And so I stopped and I took a walk and then I came back and I finished it and we made the movie like four months later or something. So we're prepping the movie and uh, we're getting everything for free. Uh, we're, in, we're working out of someone's place and we're casting on the Fox lot. I mean, Ronnie Eskel was our casting director at the time. And um, so we're casting away. We have these gr great casting sessions. And um, we were, um, it'd be Harvey Keitel. So the people were reading in the room would be Harvey, uh, me, and Quentin, and the actor. And, um, and I remember Harvey would be sitting there reading, and it would just make some people really nervous. Sometimes Harvey didn't have his shoes on. I remember years later, I go, oh, I remember coming into the room, and it was Harvey Keitel, he didn't have his shoes on. <laughs> <clears throat> and we, and we, every actor would be there 15, 20 minutes, and we read scenes over and over and over again. And so we had a pretty good cast. I mean, a great cast. And Harvey said, you know, you're almost done. And you've seen all these wonderful actors, but there are wonderful actors in New York, too. And, uh, and you should see them. And I said, Harvey, well, you know, Quentin and I are broke. We don't have any money to go to New York, and we don't have any money from the budget. And he said, okay, I'll pay for it. I'll take you guys to New York. So, um, so we left. We took the, so we cast all day on Friday. We took the red eye Friday night. And I'll never forget that three or four o'clock in the morning, when Quentin and I are in coach and Harvey's in first class and we meet in the middle and he says, guys, you know, someday you're gonna be in first class, but now it's on my diet, so you're in coach. But he said, trust me, someday you're gonna be in first class too, and we laughed. And um, we get off the plane, we go straight to his buddy, uh, Todd Thaler had given us his space in New York to cast out of. Harvey put us up in the Mayfair Hotel, 
uh, with his own money. And there we are in the casting room on Reservoir Dogs. And there's a room full of 20 guys out there waiting to get in. And uh, for a while there, I'm playing the cop who's tied up in the chair. And guys would, we'd have to say, sorry, no knives, no guns. <laughs> People would pull out a gun, they'd pull out their knives. And Quinn would have to, literally, sometimes Quinn would say, oh, stop, time out, stop the audition, no knives. <laughs> literally, <laughs> no guns. <laughs> and uh, they'd be choking me, the chair gets flown over, <laughs> the room was sweaty. And uh, in came Steve Buscemi. And um, there was something about Steve Buscemi, it was like, okay, this guy, it's got to be in the movie, and Quentin made him Mr. Pink. And so if Harvey did not bring us to New York City, we would have never cast Steve Buscemi. We had seen the movie that he was in, this wonderful little movie he had done, and we liked him, but we wouldn't have cast him unless Harvey brought us to New York. So Harvey brought us to the Russian Tea Room, and we're having a coffee. And of course, being from New York, I'd never been to the Russian Tea Room. I could never afford to be in that place. <laughs> and uh, and, Harvey's, and Harvey were talking, and I said to Harvey, Harvey, you know, you've done so much on this movie, uh, we want to make you a co-producer. He says, boys, what's taking so long? I've been waiting to hear from you. <laughs> it's about time. <laughs> we all laughed, and, uh, and that's how Harvey kind of became a producer on the movie. And he became like a big brother to Quentin and I. Um, because the making of Reservoir Dogs, from time to time, he would come to me and he'd say, Lawrence, you know, this scene that Quentin's doing is really important, and he doesn't have enough time. I know you're limited. You have very certain amount, you have a certain amount of time. You have a budget you have to make, but uh, you just want to make sure that this seems really important, and he's getting what he needs. And so, just, just want to think about it. And, uh, and it was, he was just so thoughtful. And but he made me think, because it was my first time making a movie like this. So I go to Quentin and I say, Quentin, what do you think? You know, do you do you have the time you need to finish this? You know, do you need a few more hours? We'll go overtime. You know, we'll find the money someplace. And that's it was kind of the beginning of how Quentin and I started working together in terms of me making sure Quentin got everything he needed because these scenes were so damn important. You know, because it's all about the acting and, and the way he shot it. Um, so Harvey became like our godfather. He became our big brother in a sense. At the time, Bob Kurtzman, who was one of the founding members of K&B, wanted to do a vampire movie. So Scotty had recommended Quentin. So Quentin sent over Natural Born Killers and True Romance as his spec scripts. He's like, oh, there's this guy, he's doing a lot of, um, he's doing a lot of script polishing now, but here's two scripts that he had written. So Bob uh, read the scripts, him and Quentin hit it off, and so Bob made a deal. We'll do all the effects for Reservoir Dogs for free in exchange for you writing this movie for me from Dust Till Dawn. I think it Quentin took that money. I think he actually moved out of his house in Glendale. And that that was definitely a life-changing event for all of us involved um, because of that. And I think that he was, uh, Quentin was doing a lot of script doctoring. Um, but I think that was really, that was really sort of like the first time he had gotten a check. Mm -hmm. And it was a minuscule amount of money, but it was also like, oh, well, now I got an effects house on board to do Reservoir Dog. So I think that those, that, that all those things sort of happened all at the same time. We were just getting into pre-production and we were casting and so forth and everything was kind of in, in on the road. The going, and we were maybe uh, eight weeks away or 10 weeks away from shooting and Quentin got into the lab and he said, look, he said, I really want to go to Sundance. And um, I think it'd be really great for me. And I said, I think it's a great idea too. I'll hold the fort down here. I'll keep pre-production going. And you go away and, uh, and do your thing and come back, which is what he did. What was interesting is that he was, you know, our, our lab, you know, our June director's lab is a month, you know, it's a month long. It's a, it's a director's lab and it's also a screenwriter's lab um, at the end of the lab. And he said, I'm in pre-production or pre-pre-production. I can only be there for, I think it was two weeks. Uh, and and I said, fine, <laughs> we'll we'll make it work for you for you know for two weeks. I don't think Quentin ever blossomed into a director. I think he was sort of born that way, mm -hmm. because he just did what he wanted to do, and it just innately and instinctively he just does it. 
And something that he did, which was really smart, and, and not many directors have, have done it, is he just decided when, you know, he, had, he was going to do several scenes. And he decided that, that one of the scenes he wanted to do was a scene that wasn't in the script. And he wanted to do it to just kind of explore character, but he needed to know that he could problem solve on his feet as a director. And that was an important thing for him. So I remember saying, great, what, <laughs> you know, you've got your actors here, do whatever, you know, do it, let's do it. And, uh, and I love, you know, for, for me, it's, you know, it's, it's so much fun when directors are just want to keep pushing the boundaries not only of their work, but also of what they can, you know, what they can achieve, you know, as, as a director. And I thought, if you're going to go out and make a movie, the best, you know, that, what a great idea. Yes, figure, you know, figure it out. So he wrote a scene um, that night. He brought it to the next day, and, you know, they rehearsed it, and they shot it that day, and he edited it the next day. And it's a scene that's not in the film. I love this scene. It doesn't belong in the film. <laughs> Uh, but it was a really incredible scene, and it was a scene about character, and it was a scene about Joe, the you know who's you know kind of running you know running the heist, and and he's uh, talking about a, a book that his you know that that he's just read called The Bell Jar um, by Sil Sylvia Plath. Now that is like about as as far from a book that, <laughs> and he's telling Steve Buscemi, you should read it. And it was that scene, it was, it was so simply shot and put together, but it was so revealing of character in a really interesting way. And actually one of the best scenes ever done at the lab, I think, in terms of clarity. And he, you know, and, and I think that that was a scene that, you know, for, for him, that, that sort of offered him that, you know, that one opportunity to test his skills out, but also really giving him the confidence that he could, you know, he would be fine. He could, you know, he could take on anything that came his way, that he would, you know, he would ultimately figure it out because he knew these characters so incredibly well. So that kind of experimenting, that kind of collaboration with his actors, um, you know, just, you know, deciding to shoot it in a, you know, in a more conventional way, um, I thought it was just, you know, it was genius actually, you know, for his lab experience. He came back, he had this amazing experience. There were all these great different directors and people giving their advice. And um, he shot a couple of scenes and then we went into pre-production to make the movie. I had gotten a call from Lawrence Bender, the producer of the film, and he said, we're looking for an editor, we don't have much money. Um, so we're looking for somebody who's, you know, kind of emerging, uh, you know, as, as an editor. And um, every once in a while, the light bulb goes off and there is a, you know, there is that sense of you can connect two kindred spirits together and two, you know, sort of creative, you know, spirits together. And I just, there was something, it was just pure, you know, intuitive, you know, instinctively, you know, thought. I mean, I, you know, who knew that he would hire her? But I said, you have to meet, you know, Sally. And Sally had also just moved out to, uh, out to L.A. from New York at that time, or recently moved out. So she was new, and she, and I know that she wanted to work, you know, work in film. And I also knew that she had a, you know, she had a great love of Marty Scorsese films. And, you know, and also that relationship between Marty and Thelma Schumacher was something that she, you know, really valued. And... And she also had, you know, her kind of far-reaching and eclectic taste. And I thought she would really respond to the material in a big way. I mean, Sally had, you know, came from documentaries. Uh, and then she was just starting to do um, dramas. So she, she, had, she was reading, she was in that zone where she was reading the low-budget art films. And she had the same reaction. Uh, she she actually said, "You got to read this right now." It was you know one of those you know kind of great meetings. She didn't you know she didn't know what was going to happen you know in terms of whether he was going to hire her or not. But they really spoke the same language. She desperately wanted to do it, um, so much so that she kept making sure that everyone knew where she was at all times, and she kept calling um, her agent to find out if anything had happened. We were now, it's now about a week later and we're on a family vacation in the middle of absolutely no place. I mean, surrounded by mountains, we're on a tiny little road um, in the middle of the Canadian wilderness and she demands that we stop and find a telephone. 
we find this one phone. There's literally nothing else around it for 20 miles. It's sitting on a road in the middle of the mountains, and she gets out and makes a phone call and gets the job. And I'm in the car, and I see her dancing around, around the phone, like, woo, like that. <laughs> so that's, that's where she found out that she, uh, she got the job. She, she really, for some reason, um, it was just like magnets, you know? She just, it, it was the script, but it was, it was, but it was Quentin, really, that she wanted, she, she wanted to, to work with him. We started working on the script, kind of talking about it. I mean, he'd come over to my apartment and, and pace around, which was about the size of a shoebox, and pace about. And in fact, was going to move into the apartment across the hall from me, which would have meant that he'd get even less sleep. And he, but and we would just dis, we would discuss it, um, you know, back back and forth and back and forth. And at one point, I think he was kind of he was thinking about playing one of the larger characters, and I, I, I suggested to him it's probably not a good idea because um, there's a, a lot to do in five weeks, and you could tell he had the energy to to take everything on, but. Kind of, we would, we were, we needed a director, you know, someone there all the time. It was very, because it was actually quite a complicated film, but we all knew it was uh, that that he had talent just in the from the script, and then from the conversations with him, you know, the way he, the way he was, and and then when we were filming it, I discussed that with Harvey one day, you know, saying, "What do you think?" I, said, I think this is really good, and it was. I'll never forget because um, we were, I had all the boxes of the delivery items for uh, Reservoir Dogs in my apartment. I was living in a two-bedroom apartment with my roommate, Chris Brancato, who is a writer now. And, um, and on the way to Sundance, I drove to Sundance, and on the way to Sundance, I stopped to drop off all the boxes and the, and the film to, uh, to Richard Gladstein, who was our, our executive at Live Entertainment. So I drive into the valley, and I have a little tiny uh, red Toyota that I've had for like 15 years. And I drive up, and I have all these boxes of, of all the contracts and all this stuff, tons and tons of stuff, and the, and the reels. And um, I drop it off, and I'm in Richard Glassing's office, and he looks at me with a big smile and says, congratulations, how does it feel to be unemployed? <laughs> I'm like, oh my god. It never even occurred to me that I've been working this whole year, and now officially, that basically meant officially the movie was done. It was handed over, and I had no job left, in a sense. And we laughed. And uh, I jumped in my car, and it was like a 10 or 12 hour drive from uh, basically from LA to Sundance. And it was really, uh, it was really kind of exciting. I didn't know what to expect. I'd never been to Sundance. Um, and it was really exciting to be there. There's this Saturday morning on the first, the first weekend of Sundance. It's, it's like a filmmaker's breakfast. And it's actually out at Sundance. Everyone drives out, and it's only the filmmakers and and uh, Robert Redford's there, and all the different Sundance people are there. Um, and you're getting to meet all the other filmmakers, which I never met, and, and Quentin, of course, we all went out there, and um, uh, it, was just a, it was just a great, just nothing I'd ever experienced before. I remember all of us getting in a car, because we didn't have a whole lot of money, and driving up to Sundance. I think that was the first time that we, realized that um, it was going to be a hit. Um, for the first time Sally realized that something she had cut was going to be a hit. I mean, she'd, she'd been involved in the movies going out, but not this kind of reaction. The first public screening of Reservoir Dogs was at the multiplex in Park City. And the film was um, scope, and they didn't have the right um, they didn't have the right mat. Some of the uh, movie was on the outside, of the, on the walls, not where it was supposed to be, <laughs> it came around, and it looked slightly out of focus. And, uh, and I, was, I, was, I said to Quentin, it's a little out of focus, and the, he said, don't worry, don't worry, it's okay. <laughs> so he's making me feel better. <laughs> and um, at the end of the movie, uh, right during the Mexican standoff, the power went out, and the lights went out, everything went out, and it was complete blackness. I, I couldn't believe it. And uh, finally get all the power back on, the movie kept going. And um, I was standing in the back, people going out, and they were like, hey, congratulations, Lawrence, great movie. And it was really like, wow, it was really, uh, it was one of those amazing 
just amazing moments. The thing I remember about first showing it at Sundance was that there were people that were very angry about that there was this much violence in the movie. And in the Q&A, people were a little bit up in arms about how could Sundance show a movie that so-called glorified violence. Mm -hmm. And I remember Clinton standing up and going, look, like, you saw the picture that was in the little brochure asking you to come here. It's these guys with these guns. You read the description. What did you expect you were going to see? You c and if you don't like it, you should just leave. Like, don't, that's, I made what I wanted to make, and Sundance asked if we'd come, and we came. What, what do you want from me? That was screening number one. Screening number two in Salt Lake City, there was a film burn, and the print actually caught on fire. And the negative, and, and the print burned. Um, and then the third one, everything was okay. The reaction was explosive. I remember there, was, there were people who loved it, people who hated it. There was all kinds of, uh, you know, reactions in the audience. But, but the one thing that everybody knew right there that night was that here was a new voice. Here was somebody who was really kind of blowing the doors off of, off of uh, cinema at the time, and that uh, he was going to be a real force. You could tell that early on. I've always felt with Quentin, which I love about his work, is, is that he's like an orchestra conductor in a way. I mean, he is, you know, you are leaning forward and, you know, in certain moments you're laughing at other moments. You're like, you know, it's brutal in other moments. Um, but he is so in control of, you know, of the story that he's telling and the tools that he's using to tell, to tell that story. So the, you know, the audience was with, with it at every moment. It was truly one of the most exciting premieres that we've had at, ever, you know, at, at, at Sundance. I was in shock, watched the movie. I just, from the first second it started, I was just mesmerized and wrote him a letter, which I wish, I still have the, the old computer that I, that I initially wrote stuff on. I'll bet you it's still on there. But I wrote him this big, long letter, and, and it said, now I remember why I came to Hollywood. I mean, it was so inspirational to me to see what what someone with vision and passion and enthusiasm and love could do. He was just the talk of Sundance, and it's sort of shocking that he didn't win Sundance. Yes, it did not win, um, but it got a great launch. Um, it was if probably the film that was most remembered at the festival that, you know, that year. And it was, you know, it was the launch of a, you know, of a great and enduring career. We didn't sell the film for three months after Sundance. So for three months, nobody bought the movie. And it was only about, let's see, Sundance is in January, if ever, that's right, because then we went to Cannes with the movie, mm -hmm. with Reservoir Dogs, and it was just like a month before Cannes, so in April, that Miramax bought the film, the theatrical and television rights, and Live Entertainment, who financed the movie where I worked, retained the home video. So the dream was to get into Sundance, to win it, uh, to have um, Harvey Weinstein, the, you know, Miramax, um, uh, like the movie and release it, and then, um, and then ultimately and to get into Cannes. Harvey's Harvey. Harvey Weinstein is larger than life in every way. He is the only version of the great film moguls that we have left working today. He loves movies. He, he lives for movies. He's seen movies the way Quentin's seen movies. So how would that not be an instant and perfect and enduring marriage? I'll never forget arriving in Cannes. We take the bus in from the airport and I'm carrying my big suitcase and it's hot. And uh, someone said to me, uh, I think it was Jerry Hofstetter, yelled out, I said, Bender! He looked around and said, don't, don't you know you're in Cannes? You're not supposed to carry your own suitcase anymore. <laughs> We're walking down to our hotel. And um, that was just one of those, uh, you know, being in Cannes for the first time, I was still broke, Quentin was broke, and you're in this very fancy place with all these big boats and um, beautiful hotels and movie stars and, you know, we're going, for, and we're, I had just left uh, Hollywood where these riots, and it was, you know, a very horribly exciting time to now this, the excitement of Cannes. Um, and I'll never get, you know, with Harvey Keitel and Quentin and Tim Roth and, you know, walking up the red carpet for the midnight screen of, of uh, Reservoir Dogs uh, was one of these, you know, just 
never had a tuxedo before, <laughs> you know. Well, we kind of went everywhere with it in shifts. We did all the festivals. We would go, I mean, so we'd see everyone in Spain or maybe so-and-so couldn't make it to Spain. They'd see you in France and, and so on. So we were, we, we, and then Ken, we, 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 uh, we knew. We just knew it was, it was, it was a popular. If we'd had more distribution power, it would have been even more successful at that time, I think. But that, that was the sort of the plight of the indie movie was that you couldn't break into these multiplexes, you know, because, you know, Iron Man 53 was playing, you know, and filling up every screen. So it was, it was even at that time, it was tricky. But it was, it was a better time for independent film, and by far, than it is now. He hit every festival. He saw the world. He watched hundreds of movies all over the world and became, um, a, you know, a citizen of world cinema and a citizen of the world. I remember a couple of very specific times with Quentin, because when we went to Sundance, Quentin had barely been out of California. Mm -hmm. So we went to Sundance, we showed the movie, he's now a director. But, you know, the movie hadn't been sold yet, it hadn't come out yet, people hadn't really seen the movie, so he's just this guy. And then in Cannes, after we showed the movie, it was in a midnight screening, um, out of competition in the Palais. In the days, the couple of days right after that, when we would be walking, in Cannes along the Quasette, the main street, people started to sort of recognize him because he also has a small part in the movie. And the movie just started to build this buzz and people started, we would walk down the street and people would go Quentin Tarantino. A couple people started asking for his autograph and I was sort of like, huh, you know, this is really interesting. And then the, um, right after it showed, um, our international sales company is a com was a company called Carolco. And Carolco made these huge movies, Basic Instinct and The Doors, and um, uh, a very, very large scale, Total Recall, Terminator 2. And they had all of their directors in Cannes promoting their new slate of movies. And Jim Cameron, Oliver Stone, Paul Verhoeven, mm -hmm. they saw Reservoir and they wanted to meet Quentin. And so suddenly we were invited to the big boat and all these directors wanted to talk to him and this buzz sort of started. The film is perfectly modulated. I mean, he was doing so much with cinema that I hadn't seen before. And you know, the greatest thing is, you know, it's, it's a heist film where you don't see the heist. I mean, how great is that? One of the first nonlinear films that I think works at such a gorgeous operatic level that all those choices that are were made in the in both in the screenplay and the writing and in the directing but also in the cutting just just sort of delivers on I believe a vision that was that really reinvents a genre in an exciting way. I remember I was in film school and I went to see this movie at 3rd Avenue and 11th Street and I was on a date and it was one of those classic experiences where everyone in the theater was screaming. I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I, just, I was so, so happy. It was just the most violent movie that I'd seen in years and I literally had tears of joy in my eyes while watching it. I was like, finally, someone who understands what I want to see in a movie. I remember when I first saw uh, Reservoir Dogs, yeah, they're a Telluride. Um, it's it's a it's a pretty you know reserved uh, audience, but they loved those, those pictures. They really enjoyed it, and uh, and I was watching really to, to to hear to see about Quentin because I'd heard about him, and um, and it was great seeing him in the movie because then I already could put a face to the name. Went, oh, there's Quentin. I'm gonna meet him next month, and uh, I was just so excited that there was another young filmmaker making movies because when I growing up in high school. And then when I got to college, that I, I didn't know anybody else making movies. I mean, you know, I came from from San Antonio, Texas, and moved to Austin, and I just didn't know anybody who made films. So it was a dream of mine to meet somebody else. I mean, there was no internet and things back then. You couldn't just find friends around the country that also do what you do. Um, so I knew we would we would hit it off because we obviously loved the same types of things. And I was just amazed by what he did. I mean, I was amazed by the movie. And uh, I couldn't wait to meet him. Just his command of the cinema already in his first film, and his, um, and of course his use of dialogue and his characters. And, and I could tell he was a really uh, strong director just by the way he handled 
the actors that he had. I mean, there were some really tough personalities, very singular uh, personalities, and for him to be able to wrangle them together, get their respect, and, and get those performances out of them, some of their you know, career best performances, um, definitely meant this guy was was uh, it was clear that he was he was the man <laughs> right from that movie you could just tell he was gonna pave a, a big a big way for himself 20 years ago Robert and I had just started you know mariachi was starting to make the festival circuit uh, the first festival was Telluride which was early September the next festival was uh, Toronto and you know I've been hearing about this Quentin Tarantino guy and Reservoir Dogs and all of this stuff and you know, I always would read a lot about movies because I, I love movies, and um, I hadn't gotten to see the, the, his movie. But I really wanted to see it, and when I found out that he was going to be in Toronto, I got really excited, and I kind of had a feeling, because Robert really didn't know a lot of people like himself. Both our first films were similar. Both had Guys in Black, both were violent, and we ended up having to do panel discussions together in Toronto. Um, one of the panels was violence in movies in the 90s, and it was only 1992. <laughs> I thought that was funny. We're, they're defending our, our artistic vision. We just happened to have the two bloodiest movies in the festival. And um, we hit it off right away. He said, oh, I heard about you through your agent, Robert Newman, and I would heard about him. And uh, I remember him coming up to my hotel room um, after he saw a mariachi. I actually videotaped his reaction to El Mariachi because I, I would tape the audience reactions at the festivals figuring it's probably the one and only movie I ever get to make so I taped everything so I always had the tape running so I have tape of a whole laugh track of Quentin laughing all through El Mariachi and after the uh, screening we went up to my room and he said you're gonna you're gonna really like my next movie I'm working on a movie um, I'm writing a script right now called Pulp Fiction and uh, it's three stories and it'll be told kind of like Reservoir Dogs you know non-linear and out of order but he said you're really gonna like that when I saw Quentin and Robert come into the room. We're, he came into our, our hotel room. It was like watching magic. You know, two brothers that hadn't known each, each other existed, you know? And uh, to start at that ground zero, Quentin had already been going since Sundance through the festival. So this was kind of his end of his run of the festival. And this was Robert's beginning of a run. And to be able to find someone like that, a friend that has been a lifelong friend to both of us, um, was really special. And I never forgot that moment. I even remember what everybody was wearing, you know, <laughs> which is interesting. Such a visual. It was beautiful. The bond that I had with Quentin was just fantastic because it was a peer who is doing spectacular things and it pushes you to uh, achieve more than you would normally. You know, so usually you're putting their own bar on yourself if, if other people around you aren't do, pushing you. And so um, they always say if you want to get better at something, change your peer group. Go get around people who are just much better than you and, and, you, will, and you will rise up. And, uh, and it was amazing what he could pull off. I mean, I remember he came to me he was telling me about a film that he did. He said, oh, I just finished this film, and I don't know, it still feels like a kind of movie Quentin would make. It didn't, doesn't feel like a real movie. And I was trying to be a good friend and go look at the bright side of it. He was obviously disappointed. I said, well, you know, it's good. It's good that it's not like every other movie. It's good that it's different. It's, it's better that way. You don't want it to be like everyone else's movie. He was just like, I don't know, it's just, it just didn't come out like I expected. And it turned out to be Pulp Fiction. <laughs> he did not know. As his second movie, Quint was very smart. He was a, a very studious as a filmmaker. And he understood that the second movie was almost more important than the first movie as a director. Um, and he wanted to make sure that his second movie was really successful. It was something called Sophomore Jinx. Uh, and you can make a good first movie, but if you make a bad second movie, you go into director jail. But if you make a good second movie, then you, have, you can mess up on one or two movies, but you still have a career because twice in a row you can't have it's not a coincidence he's a true director in the roger corman way too because he's always thinking about how to make his movie more economically and and he's got a strategy he there's nothing that's haphazard in anything quentin does there's divine intervention at times and magic that happens and he always leaves room for that but he's got a plan on everything so quentin wrote pulp fiction um, and I'll never forget him turning in and it said, you know, Pulp Fiction, final draft, uh, 165 pages long. And, uh, and every letter on that thing was just amazing. Every word, every page was just, just a killer. 
Um, and he had lists of everybody he wanted to be in it. Pulp Fiction was an interesting story because in this case, Quentin was coming from a place where he needed some money. He didn't make anything really on Reservoir Dogs. And he doesn't live large at all, but there's a difference between living large and living, period. And he was at that level where he really needed some money. So we got together for a meeting and said, so Quentin, tell me, like, just blue sky, the whole thing, blank piece of paper here, tell me everything you want to have in the movie and your deal, and let's see what we can do. And so he kind of ran down, you know, uh, a number of things that were um, business levels that filmmakers who had been around for a long time with a lot of hits had in their deals. And I don't mean this to be necessarily the financial side, but 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 did include that, but also the uh, control and the ability to, uh, you know, have the final cut, designate the cast, things like this. And everybody had seen Reservoir Dogs and thought it was brilliant too. But people were terrified of the violence, of the tone, of how fresh and new it was, its uniqueness, him. So the first move was to make this deal with TriStar because um, uh, we felt that they would, by putting it through Danny DeVito's company, we could acquire a lot of the artistic controls that he was looking for. We'd also have a very good financial deal on the back end that we would share. But uh, uh, we also felt that at the end of the day, TriStar would not make the movie, which was maybe the most attractive thing about the deal prospect in all. Because we could get the movie, we could get him paid to write the script, but we could get the script back if they didn't green light it immediately when he turned it in. We went into Mike Metavoy's conference room. Quentin really admired Mike Metavoy, Mike Metavoy because of the Orion films, and he sat there and lectured us as to the meetings with senators he'd had about violence in cinema. And he had a giant poster of, of Cliffhanger, which was a very violent action movie behind him and how it had made $100 million in a certain amount of time behind him, so he didn't really see the irony, and proceeded to tell us that because our film was too violent, he was going to pass on it. And every major studio followed suit and passed on Pulp Fiction. So it was amongst the first scripts that I gave to Harvey as a, I'd like to make this movie. Um, and he said, what is this thing? And I said, it's Quentin's new script, it's called Pulp Fiction. And he looked at it and it was 160 pages. So it kind of felt like a telephone book, not like a screenplay. And he said, well, you know, I mean, it's 160 pages. I mean, what is this thing? I mean, come on. And I, so I explained to him, you need to read it right away because we have a little bit of a jump on it. And he said, you know, I'm getting on a plane right now, so he's telling me I need to read it on the plane. And I said, yes, you need to read it on the plane, and you need to read it today. And he said, you want to make this movie? And I said, yes, I really want to make this movie. He said, you love it? And I said, I love it. Two hours later, my phone rings, and it's Harvey from the airplane. And he says, oh, my God. Oh, my God, that first scene is fucking brilliant. Oh, my God. Does it stay this good? I go, yeah, it stays that good. He goes, okay, stay in the office. So I said, okay. I hang up the phone. An hour later, he calls up and he goes, are you crazy? And I go, what? He goes, I mean, I mean, you killed the main character in the middle of the script. What's wrong with you guys? And I said, Harvey, just keep reading. And he goes, but this is crazy. You can't kill the main character in the middle of the movie. I said, Harvey, just keep reading. And he goes, oh my God, he comes back, doesn't he? And I said, Harvey, just keep reading. And he goes, start negotiating. So I hang up the phone. And then he calls back like an hour later. And he goes, I love it. Are you closed yet? And I said, Harvey, no, I just started and I'm trying to buy it. He said, well, hurry up. I love this thing. Harvey had, obviously was all over it and wanting it. Live was too, because they had just done Reservoir Dogs. And a French company that no longer exists, uh, CB DeMille, was also very hot for it. All three of them wanted to do it. We, we talked to everybody, but we really knew we wanted to make this deal with Harvey and, and um, Miramax. We got all the other points done, and we got down to that last point, which was that Quentin could designate the cast. And he was saying right up front, it's going to be John Travolta playing the lead. And, um, you know, it was, it was about 12.30 midnight here in L.A. It must have been 3 or 3 30 or in New York where... Harvey and Bob were, and uh, it was really 
Harvey saying, look, we've agreed to everything else. We hear you, but on this point, we really have to, let's just leave it for later. We'll see. Maybe it'll wind up, it'll be fine, but let's just close the deal now and we'll deal that later. And we said, no, no, you have to, if you want the movie, if you want to close the deal, you have to agree to that. You have to agree to it right now. In fact, you have to agree to it within the next 15 seconds. And we started counting down, and I'll have to give it to Bob. At about eight, Bob jumped in and said, Harvey, let's just say yes. We're going to make this movie. We'll figure it out one way or the other. And they did. They agreed. And John Travolta was the lead in the movie, and the rest is history. There were so many people that called. And, of course, it was tempting, because at that time, John's career wasn't what it became after Pulp Fiction or what it was in his early days. The script had gotten out. And Bruce Willis and Daniel Day-Lewis had both read it and on their own said, I want to play that role. Quentin wasn't going to cast anyone other than John Travolta. So no matter who read it, no matter who said that they wanted to play it, no matter what came up, no matter who said they wanted to send it to someone, no matter what actor called up and said, I read it and I want to be that guy, Quentin's answer was always, no, no, I cast John, so sorry. Whether I do well or not do well, I've already, this is my thinking at the time, is that I've already had a career that's of substance and, and I will deal with it and always have something to do. He may not. So as much as he's dropping the gauntlet for you, you better drop the gauntlet for him too. You better get your act together and put your best performance on it because whatever it's going to take to pull this philosophical, heroin-addicted, you know, hit man and, and deliver it to a level that is worthy. You better get your ass in gear and do it. So I, I did. I, I, I gave it everything I had. But, of course, the character is so relaxed that, you know, I couldn't give it. You can't look like you're giving it that energy. Matter of fact, you better look like you're giving it the other energy, which is no energy, <laughs> in order to come off um, uh, effectively. Foot massage. That's it. Mm -hmm. Then what did Marcellus do? Sent a couple of cats over to his place. They took him out on his patio, threw his ass over the balcony. Nigga fell full stories. They had a little garden down at the bottom, closed in glass like a greenhouse. Nigga fell through that. Since then, he kind of developed a speech impediment. That's a damn shame. <laughs> You know, it was logical of Harvey to question the choice of John Travolta. It wasn't crazy. Um, but ultimately, he went with it. And I remember when we showed him the movie, a rough cut when we were done, after 15 minutes, he said, boy, I'm so glad I cast John Travolta in this part. What a great idea I had. Laugh, laugh, laugh. Because we all knew that it was not the easiest choice, but one that once you saw it, you easily could see what Quentin saw and why it was the perfect choice. Um, Bruce wanted to play the main part. Mm -hmm. And I remember we said, well, Quentin asked him if he wants to play Butch. And we were sitting there and Quentin said, okay, and he called him up and he said, Bruce, will you play Butch? And Bruce said, well, I'll read it again tonight and I'll call you tomorrow. And Quentin said, great, and hung up the phone. The next day we're sitting there in the morning, phone rings and it's Bruce and Bruce says, I read it again, I'm in. It was that easy. Mm -hmm. It was shocking to me, because that doesn't happen on my other movies so easily. <laughs> Reservoir Dogs was a big hit on video. Uh, it, you know, this movie, eight million bucks, with this kind of cast, there was no way we could lose with eight million bucks. Um, so we, I did a budget, um, and the budget was like, I don't remember exactly, but I'd say it was about seven million dollars. So I said, okay, we're up to seven. So we eight million is our topper. <coughs> so um, we have a million dollars or some number like that. We'll give all the rest of the money away to the actors. And that way, you know, we'll just, that'll be our top point. And we divided that number up equally per week. So I said, okay, well, here's, here's Uma and Sam Jackson and John Travolta and Bruce Willis and Harvey Keitel and Tim Roth. And so, so you know, all these guys, gals are working for X amount of weeks. So I added the total amount of women and man weeks together and divided into whatever the number was, a million. And we came up to 20,000 a week. So whether you're Chris Walken working for one week or you're uh, John Travolta working for seven weeks, 
uh, you would be paid 20000 a week. Everybody on those movies worked for less money because we were making them for in total less money. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just that the actors were taking a haircut, it's that in order to keep the price of the movie at a very manageable level, the casts are vast and you can't start paying people in some uneven fashion. The thing is, making movies are always hard. Making Pulp Fiction was, was not an easy movie by any means. At one point I had a, to get to, the la to somehow fit Harvey Keitel into the schedule. I had to go to every single other actor and ask for their permission to change the schedule a certain way. Everyone did because, you know, everyone, took, everyone Harvey, Harvey Keitel was like God to everybody. Um, but it was very complicated. Uh, it wasn't, making Pulp Fiction was not easy, but it was just a joy. It was just this amazing kind of sense that you were doing something special. Now, we didn't know we were changing film history, but we really felt like we were doing something very special. Um, and every time you were shooting, you felt like you were shooting a certain movie because you're shooting, at one point you're shooting John Travolta and Sam Jackson. And that whole story was over, and then another story, and all of a sudden you're, you know, you're shooting Harvey Gaitel and you're shooting Bruce Willis and then you're shooting Uma. And so what would happen is one group of actors would be on the set and then their time on the set were over and they'd leave and it'd be really sad because they're gone, they're not coming back. But then all of a sudden, you know, Uma Thurman would show up or Christopher Walken would show up. They hadn't been there yet. And so there's a new excitement of a new, almost like a new cast, almost like making a new movie. You know, when I showed up, I had my script, but my script was kind of annotated, it was color-coded. Yeah, because I do all these different things to my script. So I had my lines in one color, I had my actions in another color, scene numbers in another color. I had stuff in the margins already, and, and he was like, what is all that? And we started talking about it, and Quentin told him, don't mess with this guy. He's like, he knows what he's doing. So all of a sudden, John realized, okay, well, we have to get I have to get in this. But, you know, he made us do stuff like go to dinner and, you know, hang out. Just go somewhere and talk. Or just go somewhere and hang out. Or go somewhere and smoke a cigarette. And uh, we would do that. So he, he, he kind of forced us to have this relationship that looked like we'd known each other for a very long time because that was the first time we met. And then we just kind of instantly fell in love and just kind of started hanging out together and being very close and, you know, finishing each other's sentences and stuff. So it was very cool like that. Um, but John's, John's just the, I mean, he's the loveliest guy in the world. It's amazing how big his heart is and, and how hard he works and is willing to work on stuff. So we got to those characterizations pretty quick. Jules, look, what happened this morning, man, I agree, it was peculiar. But water into wine, I... All shapes and sizes, Vincent. Don't fucking talk to me that way, man. If my answers frighten you, Vincent, then you should cease asking scary questions. I'm gonna take a shit. First thing I did was uh, I interviewed a bunch of heroin addicts, you know? I'd already played a hitman in Robert Altman's uh, The Dumb Waiter, so I kind of had that viewpoint down. I kind of knew the glee of irresponsibility that people who kill people have, that, you know, it's thou shall not murder is what they're disobeying. Killing is another moral code. You have to kill to eat, you have to kill in war. It's a different moral code, but murder is intentional and unacceptable. But in a criminal's mind, they have justified it. So I got that part down. Like I could, I could see how I could play an irresponsible guy towards killing. But I didn't know what the drug world was at that level. So in interviewing these heroin addicts, um, I took copious notes. And finally, before I let go of the white collar guy that was a heroin addict, I said, okay, you're more the tone I wanna play because your description of heroin is better than the street guy's description, even though I, I got some cool things from him. I need to know what I could do because I don't wanna take heroin to be the closest thing to the feeling. He said, there's nothing. I said, mm. I need something, you gotta come up with something. So he thought about it, came back and he said, okay, if you get really plastered on tequila and you lie in a warm pool of water and the high of heroin is here and the low of heroin is here, you'll come up and skim the bottom of the feeling of heroin. I said, cool, I could do that. That was acceptable to me. So I did that and I, I got that whole euphoric 
buzz. That's where the half eyes closed and the and the the feeling, the warmth through the body. And he described heroin in waves and, and ups and downs. And I designed the 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 peak of it and the low of it. The peak of the heroin was in the car driving to see Mia, and the uh, and then the low of it was, of course, at the end of the evening when you know I'm putting the the needle in her heart and I'm sobering up and that's kind of the low of it. I got to orchestrate because whether Quinton was conscious of it or not, he orchestrated a beautiful rise and fall of, of, of the evening of heroin. Anyway, I, I gathered enough information that I could really pull together a performance that I felt would be um, something that he would like. And that I went beyond his expectations thrilled me to no end because he he deserved that. My memories of, of the film are really of the process itself more than anything else and, and what a joy it was and, and how, how, how delightful Quentin and, and the cast was. We all just clicked. Ken in 1994 was Uma, Bruce, Sam, John, Harvey Keitel, Tim Roth. Everyone hit the quasette at the same time and was like, it was, crazy, you could f feel the energy in the air that all these guys and, and gals just came to Cannes at the same time. And we all stayed at the Carlton. I think Bruce and John, they stayed at the Hotel du Cat where all the big movie stars stay. And uh, where Quinn and I were kind of staying more in the thick of it at the Carlton. And you know, for me, this is the beginning of my career. I'd never been taken care of like this before. You know, you got a car and driver and they take care of your, your, you know, your dry cleaning <laughs> and your meals are paid for. And it was, you know, it was like a whole new world. I had to go and buy a jacket because I didn't even have a tuxedo or anything with me. I was like, you're supposed to dress up? Oh, okay, let me go buy something. So I went around the corner and bought a jacket. And uh, it was the most amazing thing. And I mean, it's just it's kind of overwhelming. You know, the first time you do it, you, know, you go up those steps and then you stop and turn around. And people are still screaming and shouting. And even though nobody really knew who I was, I was like, who's that black guy with those people? Who's the black guy with the stars? <laughs> what was wonderful was ever since I'd known Quentin from 1990, I guess. I think I met Quentin in 90. We made Reservoir Dogs in 91, came out in 92. <laughs> so now here we are in 94. And uh, so about four years I've known Quentin. And Quentin, um, was such an extraordinary film buff, film historian, film understander and lover of film, um, and talked about it with enormous passion from, from the day I met him. But all, all of a sudden here he's talking about it as a filmmaker at the Cannes Film Festival, saying a lot of the same stuff, but now with an international stage with a big movie behind him. And it was really wonderful. It was really, um, it was all of a sudden he got to, to flourish and got to have, spread his wings and be, uh, be in the middle of really where he deserved to be with his peers. And everybody was uh, just reacting in such a positive way. And so I'll never forget, because this is the first time we've ever done the quasette and the, and the fill in the can cars. And so you have a, you have a, you have, I don't know, it felt like 20 cars and everybody was in their own car. And you drive down the, quas the Quasette, <coughs> and there's people like, you know, five, 10 thick, screaming. And there's like, the car can barely fit between them. This is long rides, like a 20 minute ride. People are rocking John's car. And it's like yelling, Uma, Uma, Bruce, Bruce, Bruce. They're screaming. And I'd never seen that many photographers on a set of stairs. It's like hundreds of photographers, so it's blinding. And you get out, and you got this big red carpet, and it's, and all John and Bruce and Sam and Uma and every, Quentin, everyone's there walking up the red carpet together. It was just one of those, um, just incredible things that, you know, first time experiences. It's pretty amazing to sit in a theater full of people, full of a majority of people that don't speak English. And they're reading the movie. I mean, I'm used to reading movies because I like Korean and Japanese movies. So, but they were laughing in the right places. They were gasping in the right places. Everything was working in another language. And that's when we kind of knew it's like, okay, I think we got something here. <laughs> And it was kind of cool. And then the movie was over and the lights come up. And what's amazing, the way Cannes does it is there's this aisle, it's the filmmaker's aisle, where all the filmmakers are. 
and um, and all the and there's a big big area in front of you, and then the lights come down on top of you, and then they bring these cameras, and they and the cameras project you out onto the screens everywhere. And Quentin stands up and starts to wave, and, and there's a standing ovation that just goes on forever. I had never seen, seen anything like it. I don't know if there will be anything like that because it was so new. I mean, you know, brilliant movies are chosen every year, and they're usually worthy of it. But um, this was um, <clears throat> supernatural. When the movie was over, it was an amazing feeling because everybody stood up, you know, standing ovation. 15 minutes standing ovation it was crazy. And as you walk out at the top, uh, you're at the top of the, uh, the red carpet now, you look out and there are thousands of people outside again, screaming. And we all stopped up top there and, uh, and Quentin has a smile on his face. And, and we got, and we took off for our party. <laughs> we partied hard. But then the award presentation was a couple of days later. As the award's going on, we're not getting any awards. And each award that goes by makes it more and more intense because the only thing that was left was the Palme d'Or. And it was Kozlowski and us. So the only two movies that could have won the last remaining slot, I'm like, oh my God, what can happen? <laughs> you know, it's going to be one or the other. And, uh, and they called out Pulp Fiction. And uh, it was like, wow. Wow, it was a wow moment. And uh, we all went up on stage and Quentin made his beautiful speech. And it was just one of those holy shit moments. There was this whole alternative movement and that was the big world in the culture. The big word in the culture in 94, 95 was alternative. Everything's alternative and yet that was the mainstream. You know, it started with Nirvana and the music and really crossed over into movies with Tarantino. And what he did was he got people excited about movies in a way that nobody had, probably since Steven Spielberg. The whole journey that, that we're all going through at the time was, was very unusual, very unique. So it was par for the course. <laughs> and everything else that had happened, that of course he would go on and win the Palme d'Or with that movie. It just makes sense. You could feel, you could feel the wave that was happening. There was this new independent wave that hadn't happened in 20 years that was happening again. It happened before with... Uh, with Coppola and George Lucas and, um, and when Easy Rider came out and people didn't know what youth wanted anymore because they all loved Easy Rider. That's what Pulp Fiction was. It was it was like the Easy Rider of the 90s. And it, and it just threw everybody, it made everyone's head spin. So to be in that arena, it was, it was exhilarating. I remember any idea suddenly was a great idea. You, it, was, it was a different time, I mean, to think and it, you knew anything was possible. And that was scary for some, but it was freeing for a lot of us because it meant there was no one wrong move. I mean, if my movie was in Spanish with subtitles and his is Pulp Fiction and it gets released by a studio and his goes on to win the Palme d'Or, I mean, anything was possible. So you just felt like you were in the middle of this, um, this almost, uh, almost didn't feel real. So um, yeah, we, we immediately, just started doing as much as we could while we could, because we thought, this might not last. People might, might regain their senses soon. So we, we should just take it, full advantage of this situation and, and write it as fast, as hard as we can. Quentin had written the script. Somebody had, you know, somebody paid him to write a script. That's how he bought his Geo Metro, as a matter of fact, <laughs> with that money. And some producers, uh, Mayor Tepper and Johnny Nunari, came to Robert with this script before they went to Quentin. And they kind of already knew that they were friends. So at some festival, Robert was going with Desperado. They said, hey, Robert, this is Quentin, one of Quentin's scripts. And if you direct it, he'll rewrite it. OK? So then they went to Quentin separately with, when he was doing the stuff of Pulp Fiction. Same two guys, Mayor Tepper and Jan and I said, hey, Quentin, Robert has read the script and really likes it. And he's willing to direct it if you will rewrite it. So they kind of pretended like each one had already said yes, which was kind of genius, you know? <laughs> or pretty genius, I would say. And uh, so and Quentin and Robert wanting to do something together anyway, uh, it became what Dust Till Dawn is today. And Quentin did rewrite it. And uh, the, the, the first uh, half of it was pretty much what it, the movie is, always was. But after page 50, it was just like mayhem. <laughs> mayhem ensues, vampires. You know, and it was kind of like, oh, 
it was the strangest feeling to go from like this road movie to vampires. Uh, so I knew it was going to be at least fun to do. I, uh, it was my idea to cast him. I said, would you play Richie? He said, I would love to play Richie. I said, you should be fantastic as Richie. So getting to work together in so many different ways on the same projects and on different projects, um, it was, it's just, it's so fun. I mean, if you were, if we were kids in high school, we'd be working on each other's uh, film projects. So we finally, the deal ended up being made. Uh, the Weinsteins at that time was Miramax. They got a pretty sweet deal. <laughs> You know, at that point in their career, they ended up getting, you know, first dollar gross. They ended up getting, you know, they were, they were, uh, they had their own 100% um, approval over their, their uh, marketing materials, posters, all that stuff. Um, they got 100% approval at that final cut, which nobody had, both of them, even though Quentin wasn't directing that one, that happened at that moment. You know, I think that was the most exhilarating thing about Quinn's success was that it was our success because it gave everybody in that, uh, at that time, a chance to just ride that wave of uncertainty that was happening in the industry. So we went right away and signed up for From Dust Till Dawn while we were doing another bizarre movie called Four Rooms. We both went off in our other directions doing, doing whatever we wanted. He said, so, so Quentin, what are you gonna do now? Well, I'm gonna sit and write my next thing for the next couple of years, two or three years. You're gonna sit out three years? And he said, yeah, I'm gonna sit down and, and really write something I really wanna do. And you can afford to sit out three years? And he goes, you can't with the kind of money we make? <laughs> and I thought, wow, you know, he was still driving about around in that Geo Metro. <laughs> <laughs> and he lived, you know, he rented this little apartment and then he had to rent the second one. And I just, you know, that, that humility and that attitude that, you know what, I'm going to live below my means so I can write my own ticket. And I thought, this guy is never going to stop surprising me, ever. Fourteen years of a film that people are still receiving and learning from it. And I was a part of it. It's beyond measure how I feel about it, how much gratitude and what a wonderful experience I had with it. Across 110th Street, pimps try to catch a woman that's weak. It ended to be reunited with Robert, which I don't think I've seen you in a while. No, we saw each other at least once. I know you were doing the uh, the L word, right? Mm, but I haven't seen you uh, for a long time. For a long time, maybe almost twelve years. <laughs> Whatever it is, it's been a while. It's, it's been. It a distance. seems like that long ago. Really. Yes, it was like yesterday for me. Yeah. Only because I want I want to remember all of the wonderful moments that I experienced, not only with you, but on the film and with Quentin. But it, literally, I wrote a journal. I, 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 Mm. I've got to send you a page and Any see what you think. Any of the juicy parts? Yeah, they're uh, really juicy. Uh, As a matter of fact, because of where it is, it's so hot, there's smoke. You have to have a fire extinguisher. It's smoldering. Watch it's, out. It is smoldering. Um, uh, but it was such an extraordinary time and experience for me that I'll never forget. What are your fondest memories? You want to go first? Sure. <laughs> um, well, I had, had, had bumped into Quentin on uh, the streets in uh, Hollywood. And there was this wild man with a t-shirt on and shorts and he was out in the street. He was macking to this woman, you know, and, and so um, my friend says, hey, that's Quentin Tarantino. And I'm going, Pulp Fiction, Reservoir Dogs. I said, I'd like to thank him because he mentioned me in, in Reservoir Dogs. So I go, I'd love to meet him. So he calls him over, Quentin, it's Pam Greer. And, and, I'm writing a movie before you. Oh, come on, you know, <laughs> what drugs are you on? And I said, well, thank you. I I love your work. And, you know, when you uh, sent me my, she said, no, I'll find you, I'll find you. You know how he talks. And so six months later, this man had invested that much time in writing a film based on Rum Punch by Elmore Leonard. And um, he was talking about who was going to be in it. By then, I'm hemorrhaging. Yeah, I'm like, you're kidding, you stop. What happened is he sent me the script 
I don't know if you know, with 44 cents due on the envelope. And I was in my apartment in New York, and they kept sending me these notices saying, you know, you have an envelope from Los Angeles, and it didn't say from whom, but there's 44 cents due. I would say it's got to be a mattress, someone selling mattresses or flip-flops. So I go, okay, stop sending me these notices. So I, I, I tape the, the, the coins back on the notice, send it back. They, they deliver this manuscript in a manila envelope, and it says QT in the corner, and there's all these little stamps all over it. And I'm going, okay, I'll open it, and there it is. Jackie Brown. So I read the note, please read it and call me when you read it. And I'm reading it and I'm going, oh my God, it's, it's remarkable, it's extraordinary. Okay, I'm gonna be the, the drugged out pimp girlfriend, you know, <laughs> um, uh, that's the Bridget role, you know, with Sam Jackson, a black man, you know, of course, black on black, right, right. So I'm, it's so good. So he says, I call him and, and he says, oh, what do you think of it? What I, I thought you didn't like it. I've been waiting for three weeks. I'm going, I'm so sorry. Um, I just got it. And you, you know, you owe me 44 cents, but you know, it's okay. So I'm thinking if this man couldn't pay for postage, it's not finance. We're oh, going to have to wait a, another. This is a we're gonna, low <laughs> budget movie. It's going to be really low. Oh, it's going to be low, low budgets. That's... Bring your own wardrobe. Yes. And your own shoes. Yes. And, and so um, he says, no, no, I, I said, so I'm, I, I, I like the Bridget Fonda role. And he, he says, no, you're, that's Jackie Brown is for you. You're going to play Jackie Brown. And I went, I am? And I could hear it dense. I hear there was silence on the other side. They're like, maybe you're not. And um, the world stopped because someone who is a director, an artist, a craftsman of this magnitude, would write something for me. I I was I was speechless and humbled and I said, Oh my God, I've heard of how he works and who he is, you know, and I have my icons and and I just said, Oh my and he said, and so and so is gonna be and you know, Robert Forster and I went, Robert Forster, oh my God, I've had a crush on him for years. He wears great suits and and Robert De Niro and Michael Keaton. I said, Batman, and then and, and when I Sam Jackson, I said, Samuel. I I, I literally said, I do not I d I don't believe it. I really I I don't believe it until ten uh weeks later we began rehearsing where I met Robert, and the process was just magnificent. And akin to Pulp Fiction, when he gave me Jackie Brown, he said, Pam Greer is Jackie Brown. Mm -hmm. And there was no debate. And there were lots of other actresses that could have very, very easily played that part. Um, before we made the movie, there were a lot of actresses that could have played the part. But once you see the movie, it's Pam Greer. And you can't imagine someone else playing it. Um, but she wouldn't. She wasn't the most logical choice, given also where her career was at at the time. You know, it, if you went to a casting director and made a list, she would be on the list, but she might not be at the top of the list. For Quentin, there is no list. There's one name. That's it. Same thing with Robert Forrester. My career was uh, was dead. I had no agent, no manager, no lawyer, no nothing. I was spending uh, my mornings in a little restaurant on Santa, Bo on Santa Monica Boulevard. And um, in walks uh, Quentin Tarantino. Uh, and I yelled at him. Uh, I had <laughs> met him once doing an audition for uh, Reservoir Dogs. I thought I was going to get that job. I, was, I hit it out of the park, I thought. And as soon as I uh, finished the, uh, the audition and walked out of the room, Quentin came out and said, this isn't going to work out. Uh, this part is going to go to um, uh, um, Lawrence Tierney, whom he had dedicated the script to. I hadn't bothered to read it or something. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, oh, of course he's going to give it, you know. But he said, don't worry, I won't forget you. Years go by, and he does um, uh, uh, Pulp Fiction. And now it's several, a year or two later. And he walks into this restaurant. I see him. I'm sitting with another actor. I yell at him. He comes over. We blah, blah. What are you doing? He said, I am, uh, I am uh, adapting Rum Punch. He, he said, why don't you read it? And, of course, I did. Six months later, I walk into the same restaurant, and he's there 
in my usual seat. And as I approach him, he lifts up the script and says, read this, see if you'll like it. And we have a conversation, and I go home, and I read it. And I say, but what part does he want? Right, we both, what, what, what? What part could he want me before, for? Because right. nothing seemed right. It couldn't be Max Cherry. They won't hire me for something that big. I'd had that experience a number of times that, you know, I got close to a job. Right, right. And, uh, and the director says, look, I can't, uh, the, the, the distributors won't, uh, won't uh, hire you. Right. So I... I had a second conversation with him in which I said, look, uh, I don't think they're going to let you hire me for this. <laughs> and he says, and I will never forget it, I hire anybody I want. And that's when I, the world stopped. Right. Well, I'm not kidding. No, it does Just stop. like it does that. Stop. It's, Your whole day. Everything stopped. And I said, oh, Bob, you got another chance. This is the chance that you've been playing for. I kept hoping that some young guy who liked me growing up would turn into a movie maker and give me a good part. <laughs> and here it is. Uh, and so, um, there you have it. It was, uh, it was a gift the size of which cannot be exaggerated. And, uh, and I, I couldn't believe that it was Max Cherry until he told me so. I was forced to, I mean, what a, what a sweet, I mean, my God, sweet man. But... Even more than that, amazingly subtle and giving and prepared and happy. Because I think one of the first things I did was I, 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 I didn't hear you wash your hands in his office. And that was like the best scene, the most fun. He was, he was perfect. <laughs> Just perfect. Uh, uh, uh. I didn't hear you wash your hands. Sam Jackson. This guy, if I missed a, a line or if I stumbled a line, he could give it to me. He not only knew his words, but he knew my words too. You, you, don't, you don't meet many actors who can, uh, who can help you out in the middle of a scene. Mm -hmm. You usually gotta go off camera and say, yeah, well, wait a minute, tell me that line again, or something. Well, it was important to me that Ordell, you know, have that specific look, but um, Quentin kept telling me I haven't figured out what he looks like, but that's not what he looks like. So I had Robert, my hairdresser, call the wig maker, and we had the wig made anyway. And then I had the little braid made for my chin and whatever. She did all this stuff. So one day when they were having a production meeting, I, I just put all the stuff on. And something happened. I, I wanted some water or something. And I just got out of his chair, and I ran through the production meeting, headed for the craft service table, and they were going, wait, wait, hey, 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 who are you? Wait, get out of here. And I walked over to the table, and he was like, oh, my God, okay. And he said, that's what, I said, it's Ordell. And he's like, okay, you're right. To be a part of someone's dream was extraordinary and magical in a sense. And then the day when we have our first day of rehearsal, and in walks Samuel Jackson, Robert De Niro, Michael Keaton, Robert Forrester, and then Bridget Fonda, her legacy of her family. And as we're sitting at the table, just molding our characters with Quentin, and, and we're more listening to him. And I was just struck by his energy and his ability to, with each one of us, have distinct direction and distinct ability to say, okay, this is Sam's beats, Pam's beats, Michael's beats, Robert and Nero's beats, and, or, and, and be a maestro in front of us. And we're all instruments in this fabulous orchestra. And I love the fact that Quentin let us take our time doing stuff. Um, I remember that moment in the car when I'm looking through the books and can't find my money, and I just want to go, <laughs> it's Jackie Brown. Quentin goes, no, 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 take your time. Take your time. Go through every possibility of what could have gone wrong and then come to that conclusion. And I was like, really? You gonna let me? Really? That's a lot of cinema time for nothing to happen. But then I had to go back to this thing that somebody told me early on when I first started doing movies. They said, every time a camera's on you, always make sure there's something on your mind. No matter what you're talking about, you know, you can be talking about that thing, but know what the next thought is or where you're trying to go with that thing so that people can see that. So that was an opportunity for me to sit there and kind of, you know, ruminate, run through every 
scenario, everything else before I came up with Jackie Brown. Um, and it's one of my sort of like favorite moments, aside from killing Bobby, it was good. When we first found out that De Niro was interested in the movie, mm -hmm. De Niro called up and said he wanted the Robert Forrester part. And Quentin said, no, I, I cast this guy, Robert Forrester. And then I remember going, Quentin, ask him if he wants to play the other guy. Ask him if he wants to play the other part. And Quentin was like, no, he's not going to do it, you know. He wants to play the lead, I understand, you know. I said, well, let's just ask him. And he did, and, and, and De Niro said, yeah, I'd love to. And he played the other part. And the scene where De Niro shoots Bridget Fonda and... Right before he shoots her, he said, you know, if you say another word, I'm going to shoot you. And she turns around and she starts to talk and he shoots her without any any fanfare. Don't seem sure to me. Hey, don't say... Don't say anything else, okay? Keep your mouth shut. Well... I mean, don't say one fucking word, okay? Okay, Lewis. And I was standing right kind of near the camera, and De Niro See? shoots her, and he just kept walking out of frame. And he walked right up to me, and he goes, oh, that was fun. Bobby is just <laughs> unbelievable. Bobby's unbelievable. What was it like to work with Pam Greer? I mean, she's amazing. You know, I was OK. With it for a long time, I was like, yeah, Pam Greer, yeah, I'm having a good time. Yeah, she's a nice woman, da da da. And until that day, um, I was in her apartment and I had my hands around her throat. And, you know, it was just at that moment when I got my hands around her throat where I went, wow, you are choking coffee. <laughs> this is coffee. You're choking coffee. Which was kind of like, oh my God. You know, all those. Masturbatory fantasies of <laughs> the 60s came flooding back to me. It's like, I got my hands on her, I'm up against her, her breast are checking my chest, and it's like, wow, who ever thought I would be here? And you, you know, it's just stuff like that. It kind of happens once a movie sometimes. I remember when I was doing Sphere, it happened. I was doing this scene with just me and Dustin, and it was kind of like, that's Dustin Hoffman. And then when I was doing Jackie Brown, I was sitting there, you know, talking to, to Bobby in that bar. So, uh, to what you say? She ain't have to say shit. I know Melanie. That bitch gonna be fucking you two minutes after I'm out the door. Melanie real good about throwing the fucking niggas away. I mean, she ain't no damn good at it, but she likes to fuck. No, so she ain't your girlfriend. That what you thought? No, I wasn't sure, no. But you fucked her anyway, though, huh? Well, they're not your, they're not your girlfriend part I, I felt more about. Uh -huh. Well, I hope you felt appropriately guilty afterwards. Afterwards, I did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. And I realized, wow, it's Robert De Niro. I mean, because those are people when I was you know, a person in New York or even in Atlanta going to college, watching them on screen, it never occurred to me that I would see them, meet them, let alone be in a scene with them. So it's um, it's kind of heady stuff when it happens. You know? And for them to look at you and go, well, that was great, kind of go, for real? OK, OK. <laughs> it's like, you go to your trailer and clap your hands and have a good time. After you see Jackie Brown, read Rum Punch and go, how did he, is this the best one? How did he do it? It's just extraordinary. And there's so many things to think about. Um, the scenes, the adaption that just Quentin, just Quentin. And he is, uh, in many ways, because he has so many textures, so many aspects about him, his music, he finds music and scores that tell a story without words when Jackie comes out of the jail. Her timber, her speed, her dragging of her feet, been stripped of everything, not knowing where to go. Someone's gonna kill her. She's betrayed someone. She has no job, no future. That was the last job she had. So she has, she's going home to nothing. And just her, her posture, 
and Quentin sets it up and, and you don't have to do a second take. You just, let's just do one for safety, but you never can do that first take better because it's so authentic, so on point. I think everyone wants to work with him because you will learn to direct yourself. And I learned more about myself. And he's so intuitive. He's objective, and then he's he's uh, w watching you and helping you evolve. Because there's so much that you can't experience when you're in the moment. You know, like just kicking, how you'll twitch your leg or kick your leg or something that you do. He'll say, "Oh, do you notice you're doing that?" And you go, "No." Well, you are. I like that. Keep it. You know. So, oh, okay. So he allows you. When you work with him, you're liberated. This movie gave me a, a gigantic lift, and uh, and uh, you know for that uh, I'm sure Pam and I both uh, uh, were really uh, thankful, indebted, and uh, grateful to uh, our friend Quentin. I'll send you a postcard. Will you? I sure will, partner. It's such a consummate film. It's kind of cursed because it's not Pulp Fiction 2 in a lot of people's minds. Um, to me, you know, it's his best film because, you know, all the characters are very uh, defined and well stated. Um, the action plays out subtly and completely for every character in the film. There's a completion, even though I'm still not, I'm still not happy about the way I died because I think Ordeal's smarter than that. But we had to stop somewhere. <laughs> If I never work again, I have been to the mountaintop. This is, this is an extraordinary experience with someone. There's nobody that can beat Quentin at that game, that game being the game of, uh, of film history, knowing about movies, both films from the past and current ones that other people never even crosses their horizon. I always like to joke around with him and say, you bought a screening room that had a house attached. And that's kind of the way I look at it. Like, you know, the screening room is this, is this phenomenal place. It's his cathedral, if you will. It's where he lives most of his life. And he's a film buff like nobody has ever seen before, combined with a phenomenal memory that's frankly scary. One of the first uh, dinners we had, we were sitting there together talking and we started talking about movies and then we started talking about Hong Kong movies because I collect Asian films too. I watch Asian films all the time. And we started talking about Asian films and he was like, I never had a conversation about these films with anybody else because nobody else watches them. And then when we started to work, he would pass by my trailer and he would always hear somebody kicking, screaming, getting chopped or something in my trailer because I watch Hong Kong movies all day long in my trailer. I remember one year I made a movie and he made a theater. He said, all my friends made movies this year, I made a theater. He made a home theater that was like the end all be all of home theaters. And he, he had a ton of film prints. And we got to watch movies in style. We just said, this is the life. Because I remember when we were doing Dust Till Dawn, I'd go over to his apartment over there on Crescent Heights. Yeah. And he had his little 16 millimeter projector and he'd be threatening up white lightning. <laughs> and we'd be watching on a bed sheet. And I remember then he turned to me, and we still quote it because it's so funny because I remind him about this all the time. He said, I remember, Quentin, we went there, we're watching, we're watching White Lightning, and you turn to me and you go, isn't this the life? Don't we have the best life? We're sitting here watching our own film friends. And it's this little rinky-dink 16 millimeter, but that was the life. When we were in Berlin for Inglorious Bastards, he would have one of his 35 millimeter prints shipped to Berlin every week, and we would have a screening for the crew every week. And it was great. It was like on a Wednesday or a Thursday night, seven o'clock, everyone was done working for the day. We walked across the street, we ate pizza, we had beer, and he would screen one of his prints and he does an amazing introduction for them. And it's somehow always, not always, but typically related to the movie, somehow, some way. Um, in Berlin, he screened one of Till Schweiger's first movies, which, you know, Till was like, you have a print of my 35, you have a 35 millimeter print of my movie, like couldn't even believe it. So it's related to the cast or the crew or the script or the location or wherever we are. And I think that the crew loves it. I mean, they they thrive on it. Sometimes I'll be like, Quentin, why are you screening a movie at one o'clock in the afternoon? Nobody's gonna go. And he's like, yes, they are. And they do, they love it. It's a bonding experience and it's just, it's special. It's one of the special things that he does. He's seen 
you know, more films and knows more about them and has a point of view about little details of each one of them than any 10 other people combined you could ever meet. It's a phenomenal gift he has. What Quentin also did was he really validated genre movies in a way that no one quite had before. He brought attention to films that really had been overlooked. He has this magic wand of cool that anything he touches becomes cool. He loves celluloid, he loves film, he loves the images of films, he loves posters, he loves anything that has to do with his business. And much like Martin Scorsese, it is the same sort of, thank God we have these people like Coppola, like Scorsese, like Lucas, who love the value. They, they see a value beyond what most, pe most people see in a bunch of film cans. And Quinton is a collector of prints of movies, even obscure mu movies. You know, what Tarantino did was he used his clout to immediately bring these films to the public. Like he released Jack Hill's Switchblade Sisters and suddenly everybody's getting turned on to Jack Hill and they're all looking at Pam Greer movies and they're watching black exploitation films. And then he brought Lucio Fulci's The Beyond into theaters. And these are films that you couldn't even find on videotape. I mean, maybe there was one crummy VHS tape and now you're seeing a new pristine 35 mm print in the theaters. And that's what was so cool about it was Quentin, for as much as he's a guy who grew up in a video store, is all about the theatrical experience. He wants you to see these movies in a crowd with other people. And he still keeps that alive today. You know, what's, what's so great about Quentin is he told me the death of interesting cinema was watching movies at premieres and in screening rooms. I said, now that you're a director, can't you get any print sent to your house? He's like, that's how you lose touch. He said, the only way to tell what people still want to see is to go see a movie with a paying audience. They'll tell you whether they're interested or not. And when he's researching and writing his own movies, he does these QT fests where he'll play movies for a week, but it's almost like a market research to see which material is still connecting with a modern audience. The first time I met Quentin Tarantino was at a press junket for a film called Iron Monkey. I think Harvey uh, and the Miramax team at board and Quentin was presenting to the, to the world. When me and Quentin met, what we found we had in common was the love of kung fu movies. And I think it was during that moment uh, we realized that we both had a vast knowledge of the Asian cinema. When he shows you a movie, he shows it to you in a different way. And he, he would have his film festivals, his grindhouse film festivals, type film festivals down in Austin. He educated the audience down there too. He says, you're not, you don't come in here and you don't laugh at the movies. You laugh with the movies, but you're not above the movies. So whatever I show you, you watch it as if you're, you watch it and take it seriously. If it's entertaining and it's funny, you laugh. You don't put yourself above the movie. So that kind of a mindset is really essential to any of those movies that you watch. So anything that I watched, I always had that in mind. Anything that he would show me in his house, um, he would give a very eloquent speech before the movie started about why he was showing it to you, what he liked about it, gave you his point of view and kind of pre-framed it and you watch it and you enjoyed it in its context, no matter what it was. In its context, you, you understood and you, and you got what it was. Part of the reason Austin is so on fire for movies and so many you know, filmmakers are coming out of the woodworks from there is because they were exposed to things like that. So the encouragement of seeing things they never even heard of and Quinton explaining the, the, the value of it, the historical value or what it meant to him has, was huge, the generosity of that. Quentin really has always been pushing other filmmakers and really helping and getting behind them because he, he knows he's from the same world. We didn't, we didn't um, inherit this. We really came in this on our own and, and were shepherded by people who really uh, liked our, our work. And so we do that back to other people who, we know the task is daunting. You come in and you try to be original voice and you try to do something in this industry, it, it's tough. So any kind of help you can get or inspiration or encouragement you can get along the way is, is, is fantastic. So we try to do that as much as we can. I know we put out contests sometimes or anything that just kind of get people motivated to come and do something and uh, and support them and, and see what happens. You never know what happens. You throw those seeds around, they, they grow and they sprout and, and uh, others that you find that just come walking by, you give them as much inspiration and help as you can because you appreciate that. You've had that done to you and you want to give it back. It comes from the point, if you just meet somebody that's that, that he really grooves with and he, he he can't help himself. He wants to get involved and, and work with them. And he, he considers it like a, uh, a privilege that they invite him in, as opposed to the other way around. 
So that's, uh, I think that's, a, again, another sign of the purity of artist in him. You know, what I realized from Quentin was um, that I was in the presence of a genius, a walking encyclopedia of film. And I asked Quentin, can he be uh, my teacher, my mentor? And he agreed. Um, and it's kind of cool because, you know, because Quentin told me, you know, he was a big Wu-Tang fan. He loves my work and things like that. And we just was buddies that just both had our own separate worlds. And for me, you know, people look at me as the abbot of Wu-Tang and a teacher to many. And for me to take somebody on and be my teacher, or my Sifu or master, as they call it in martial arts, is unique. But I saw a master, and I wanted to be a student, and I asked him, and he agreed. And eventually, that led to me traveling to China, to Beijing, and sitting on a set of Kill Bill with a notebook, and really absorbing the process of filmmaking from a modern master. With Quentin, you know, the fact that he gets to expand his universe and his relationship with Eli, and being involved in the hostile movies and, you know, Quentin seeing that and saying, oh yeah, you know, that, this is, this is great. I mean, Eli loves movies just as much as Quentin does. Eli loves a different type of movie and he feeds off of it. And I think that he looks to Quentin as a mentor and they're lucky to have each other. They really are. They're lucky to be able to collaborate and work together and teach each other things. It really is pretty exciting to see that he has that uh, that level of interest in, in cultivating future filmmakers. As time went on through the course of uh, filming Kill Bill, I think we, uh, um, you know, we shot different locations from China to Japan and then Mexico. We was in Mexico at a, a place called Carrez, a uh, great resort. I think somebody once asked Quentin the question like, well, what's, what is this guy doing with your movie? He said, no, you know, we're just, you know, he's just a friend of mine, he's just observing. I haven't figured out what I want to do with him. And I had no idea what he wanted to do with me or how I could help. I just wanted to learn. But um, maybe a week later, we were at the table again, and uh, I don't know if somebody asked a question or not, but he made an announcement. I figured out what I want Bobby to do for the film. I want him to be uh, my composer. Um, he don't use composers. And he told me, I want you to kind of like produce the music the way you do your, your albums, Wu-Tang. He loved how I, how I work in the music world. And I was like, ah, oh, it'd be my pleasure to do, to do any, any capacity to help out with this film. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's another guy I like to call my classmate, Eli Roth, who is, um, you know, we see him at Quentin House and we all hang out together and travel together. And, um, you know, we come with the idea of me bringing one of my visions to life. So then we present it to Quentin and he said, yes, you guys are ready. Riz is ready. And you guys doing it together would be great, you know, in his view. But it wasn't until Quinn came over to China and he was sitting in Video Village with me and Quinn taps me on the shoulder and says, you know, you're doing a great job. And I was like, I've graduated, I'm doing it, I'm making my teacher proud. I think I did something one day on the set, he said, ah, oh, the student taught the master something today. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? I'm like, wow. like. I'm really doing, I'm really showing and proving that I could be a good student, you know what I mean? And I could take, you know, this wisdom and apply it to my art and bring forth, you know, more additive to this genre of movie making. In this business where not everybody is family, these guys are family. And it's, we're really lucky to have it. And sometimes everyone's like, why are you doing that? What are you doing? But that's what life is about. It's about we all make movies and we're all part of the circus, but these guys support each other in a really amazing way. When it came time for me to do my first movie, it was Reservoir Dogs, and, uh, uh, and it was in that weird situation because I didn't know a damn thing about editing, but I knew my movie. So I had to find somebody who would be inspired by me, but wouldn't be the boss, wouldn't just tell me uh, that I know what I'm talking about. I know I don't know what I'm talking about, all right? Um, uh, but I wanted the nice person, all right, that would be fantastically talented and would take care of me. <laughs> and then when uh, Sally Minky, my editor, uh, who's, I'm really positive, the only reason you guys are giving me this is because I, 
because you were appreciating Sally. It's a de facto Sally Award. All right. Uh, uh, she came. <laughs> She, uh, uh, she came in and, uh, to, uh, uh, for the interview, and the movie she had, she had done Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> and I, I gotta tell you, man, you know, before I started Kill Bill, I told Uma, I go, hey, I, we've got the editor of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> and I don't care what anybody says, Donatello is not that good of a fighter. That's all Sally. So she came in, and I had actually seen one of the movies she had done before. I thought she was so cool, I didn't want to watch any of her work, because I didn't want to talk myself out of it. I wanted to go from my first instinct. Now, don't put editing under a microscope. If I think I can work with her, and I think she's talented, and she's just got it, she's got it. And here's the deal. She is my only true, genuine collaborator from beginning to end, and that's the way it is. I'm a writer-director, so I'm always coming from like the written word prospect of it all, and uh, that's why it takes such a long time, because I'm always gonna face that blank page every time I start a new one. And um, the thing about it was, I've always considered this is the case, is, your final draft of the script, the final, that's it, boom, boom, perfect, send it to the Smithsonian. <laughs> it's just the sloppy first cut of your movie. <laughs> and the final cut of your movie is the last draft of the script. And so tonight, I want to thank my co-writer, Sally Minky. Thank you very much. This has been a wonderful evening. We came out of NYU film school, and then she spent the next four or five years in New York cutting just documentaries. What really made her the editor she was is that for the longest time, she had to deal with a collection of footage and make a story out of it rather than it being scripted. Um, she also, I think, because a lot of those documentaries were verite style, was dealing with a whole collection of uh, interesting people. Um, and so in a way, it's like a study, a way to study performance because you're looking at all these different people and you're looking at subtext, the same thing, but in real people. So she moved from documentaries um, into drama. Uh, her first movie was a little independent movie with Griffin Dunn in it um, that was really uh, first dir time director, kind of raw, and um, so that was her first drama. And then Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was really her first sort of like, oh wow, this is a this is a Hollywood, for her, at that time, it was a Hollywood movie. She loved working with Quentin. They, I'd come to pick her up or something, and I'd just hear giggling. So you'd, you'd come through the edit room, and it was in this crappy little office, and I remember the door would be closed, and I'd just hear Quentin laughing and Sally laughing, and I thought, um, what the, what? I thought this was a, you know, an intense movie, but, but, but I, I know it's comic as well, but, they would just laugh. And that, I, I think that happened every time I went to the edit room and Quentin and Sally were in the room working. I would hear giggling. It was like two kids in a, like, appreciating their work. <laughs> we don't ever know what happened in that room. We don't know what happened between Sally and Quentin. They're the only two that know. Whatever it was, it was magic and it was amazing. And it's unfortunate that she's not here for him and for all of us, but they just, they were amazing together. My memory is that really from the second they started working together, Sally just loved uh, working with Quentin. And I'm assuming from all the laughter that Quentin loved working with Sally and, um, I, I think um, 
I think she expected that um, or, and hoped that they would keep working together after Reservoir Dogs. As soon as Quentin was done with the script or getting ready, she'd be like, is he gonna hire me again? She never, she never took it for granted that she was that first call, that he was never gonna make a movie without her. She would always say, oh, I don't know if he loves me anymore and I think he's mad at me and I don't know if he's gonna hire me again. And I was like, Sally, of course he's gonna hire you again. Or I would say to Quentin, I know you're almost done, but Sally has this other movie. Should she take this other movie? No, she shouldn't take that other movie. You know. I mean, it was just a given that Sally was going to be on every one of his movies. But she questioned herself, as we all do sometimes. But it's amazing to see it from the other side where you're like, of course you're going to be on his movie. I mean, I'll never forget meeting Sally for the first time. She came in all bubbly, full of enthusiasm. It was almost like Quentin and Sally, they could just finish each other's sentences. It was just what this intangible thing that happens between people. There's such a trust such a bond uh, that happened between them. Quentin called me right after he met Sally. And he said, I've met this gal. She's the one. She's going to be my editor. I just know there's something about her. We're meant to work together. And that was it, you know. They had the most amazing relationship. I mean, I've been in you know, ADR sessions where, like, she was around and uh, he was kind of distracted and she made sure that things went right and she could actually speak in his voice in a specific kind of way. And she had a skill that he didn't have that he relied upon in a very honest sort of way and he learned a lot from her about how his process works in terms of the kinds of stuff that she would put together for him and say, well, this is what you mean. Uh, and her style is as definitive in his films as his directorial style. They're almost the same thing. Um, he knew what to shoot for her to make his film sing in a specific way, and she knew how to arrange the music to make his notes a real symphony. Those two together was such a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. That's a great sandwich for filmmaking. She loved what we did as much as we love what she did for us. I mean, even though we don't know how to say it sometimes because we, we think we did it, so, oh yeah, that's the way I did it. And you know, if you look at it really closely, you'll see, oh wow, she made me look a little better there because I was getting ready to mess that line up and she like kind of snipped around it and made that to kind of work. Um, but I always enjoy being in her presence. Um, because she made me feel like I was special in the process. And I always know that, you know, actors in my mind are like the least special people in that process because, you know, everything else, you gotta have the lights, you gotta have this, you gotta have that. And editors can make or break your performances. Uh, and she always found the best parts of me to put on screen. Uh, and that made me love her more, and she always said that I didn't have any bad parts, which made me love her even, even more. It was great. Sally always pushed the bar higher than anybody thought it could go. That was what, how she felt about the work. So it was never good enough. It always had to be better. You know, we used to call it the disease at NYU. You just couldn't stop making the movie. Um, you do anything, you know, to, to keep trying to, to make it more effective. And, uh, and I think they were both like that, uh, which is probably why, um, uh, you know, that became such a great collaboration. That sequence in Pulp Fiction, uh, with the needle was one of her favorite sequences. I remember when she was cutting it, there was a moment all of a sudden it just went, and it started, and it worked. It's not really about fancy editing, it was really about... Um, creating the scene and the performances and being in the right place at the right time. So she always liked that, but that I think she was really proud of Inglorious. She loved what she did in Inglorious. Alors, Emmanuel, puis-je vous appeler Emmanuel? Oui. Et donc, Emmanuel, expliquez-moi. Comment se fait-il qu'une jeune femme comme vous, on arrive à posséder un cinéma À 
après coup. Verdict. Comme je disais, pas si mauvais. You know what she liked all of it. She she loved um, House of Blue Leaves and Kill Bill. There's a moment she liked, and I've used it sometimes to illustrate that when you have contrast, um, you create um, excitement. In Reservoir Dogs, where they had no money, no time, it's a very uh, static scene. I think it's Harvey and S Steve Buscemi in the bathroom, and Steve Buscemi starts telling him what happened, what went wrong, what happened. And it goes on for a really long time. It's just one shot, if my memory's right. And then all of a sudden it cuts into the steady cam shot of Steve running down the street shooting after the robbery. And it's really only two angles from behind and in front of him. And it feels like the most exciting thing you've ever seen in your life. Because before it, you were like completely s static. And then this thing goes bang at you and you're like, whoa. And I think it was, that was the beginning of sort of that kind of, um, you know, the, in, in Inglorious, when they're in the, in the club, that scene is broken by intense violence too. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's sort of that ability for it to go, to go to hell all of a sudden, real fast and really in your face, which is a, it's a really effective um, cutting technique. Yeah. Also in, in Pulp Fiction, when Bruce Willis is in the Honda, and he stops and looks up, and Ving Rams is crossing the street with his his fast food container. She always enjoyed like finding the the moment where she kind of lulled the audience into something, or stopped to open up something, and then slapped them again. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, it was designed. I mean, Quentin designed it that way, um, so it's not it's not Sally's fault, but it but Sally loved um, she loved doing that. She loved manipulating those moments. It was just a real partner. And he would talk about their relationship, like when uh, they were working on the movie together, and she was pregnant, and he felt like I felt like it was his child too, I mean, like he was part of the father too because he was there with her through all her pregnancy, and uh, it was a really close relationship. I mean. Maybe I'm almost envious that I didn't have an, ed an editor to, to share that relationship with. I'm always in there cutting by myself just to save money. <laughs> but um, but yeah, she's a, she was terrific. Sally was a, is a big contributor and, a, and, a, and a, real, a real voice in his movies. When she was pregnant with um, Bella, she was afraid that all the, the murderous noises coming out of, this, the, uh, out of the Avid were going to somehow affect how Bella came out and she would have this violent child that remembered all this profanity and, and horror. Um, so she was, uh, she was always sort of, uh, and she was, of course, always worried about that there was radiation coming out of the monitor. So she bought special UV filters to protect her. But she's actually in there pregnant, you know, still working away. She was very quick, very fast editor and very efficient. And when she, she leave at the end of the day, she was here for dinner and making dinner and taking care of the kids. Uh, that was her first priority. The only movie that she edited for you was that Tom Goes to the Bar? Was that? Yeah, my first eight-minute movie is the only time we worked together. Uh, I thought to myself, at last, here was a place where you could let your hair down. It filled with people like you wouldn't believe. You know, people who finish what they start. Oh, we cut stuff, some documentaries before. But yeah, that was the last time. 
Well, she, I could never book her. She was always busy with Quentin or something. But I think also it was sort of a silent agreement between us that our jobs would be separate, that we would help each other uh, and collaborate in the way that, you know, I'd read her script and she'd read mine and um, she asked me how she was doing and I'd ask her how she, I was doing. But our careers were separate. And, um, and I think that was a, eventually a smart move, even if we didn't consciously do it, that's the way it happened. And uh, it made it much easier to come together and go, oh, this happened to me today, oh yeah, this happened to me. Um, plus Sally would have been too much of a taskmaster in, in, for me. She would have, I mean, it would have been, she would have been hassling me about why didn't you get this close up and how could you tell a story like that? And it would have been, uh, you know, it, it would have been a married couple in an edit room. And that's not fair to anybody. <laughs> it's strange to think of a Tarantino film without Sally Menke because she's really his other half. I mean, they were such close friends and collaborators. And I was in the fortunate position of being able to work side by side with Sally where I was acting in Glorious Bastards, but also directed Nation's Pride. So I thought Sally would cut it, but I shot so much footage, they're like, all right, let's just set up an avid for Eli. So Sally was in one room and I was in the next room and I would cut some scenes together and I'd, Sally would come in and take a look at it. And she was just the most wonderful, loving person. I mean, all around the avid were pictures of her kids and her beautiful kids, Lucas and Bella and the dog Zoe and her husband, Dean. I knew her as a, as a mom um, of, of her beautiful children, um, but her daughter, Bella, and my daughter, Zoe, they went to a summer camp in um, upstate New York, a place called Frenchwoods. And so one summer, just a few, four years ago, I think it was, um, we were there at the same time, you know, in this sweltering heat, you know, visiting our kids, doing plays, and ended up on the lawn, just hanging in. It was just kind of this, moms bonding about daughter stuff. You know, our kids were just going into that teenage intense, intense time. And, and um, she was a, a wonderful, warm, connected human being. Yeah, there's a song that I, that I wrote called Gone that um, when I first wrote it, I was, um, I was writing it um, with the idea of people we lost. Of course, I lost my cousin ODB, um, but and I wrote some of the lyrics towards him, but it wasn't until Sally passed that I finished the song. And instead of selling it, I gave it out to the world as a gift to her. And, you know, she touched many people's lives and they was collecting things that, you know, for charity and things to, you know, to, you know, to send to the family. And I was like, well, it's easy to send money. You know what I mean? It's easy, you know, to send flowers. What can I give? You know what I mean? And she always told me she dug my music, and she, you know, she, you know, she like, you know, say, uh, uh, children like Wu Tang Clan. When she called me for some tickets one day, so I said, what can I give? Uh, the let's show, her, you know, how I feel and show, you know, how much I respected her as a person and, and we'll miss her. And so the song "Gone," um, I put it out on a Wednesday. It was the first song I ever gave away for free. I said, well, I'm gonna do Woo Wednesday and I'm gonna give a song to my friend, Sally Menke. It's called Gone. And in the song, it does mention that through our seeds, we all reach eternity. Peace and blessings is just another journey. And what I mean by that is through our seeds, meaning through our children, we all gonna reach eternity because we keep reproducing ourselves and, our, and our, our ways and actions through our genetics will come out. But also through our seeds of thought or through our seeds of work. You know, so her films that she worked on and the people who she's spoken to and inspired and through her children will carry on to eternity. And that's what that song was all about, is that, you know, it's just another part of this journey.
you know, Quentin thinks a lot about his art and what he's doing, and his, and he knows that he's only on the planet for a short period of time, and he has a certain amount of work to do while he's here, and he's very conscious about, uh, you know, the fact that he has an extraordinary gift. He knows that, not in any kind of a um, um, egotistical way. If anything, I'd, I'd say it's more a sense of responsibility that he, you know, he's, he's ex told me before that, you know, everybody's, everybody's given certain gifts and you're on the planet to do a certain thing and this is what he was put here to do. And so he takes it really seriously. When we were shooting Inglorious Bastards, w the crew went out one night and there was a video screen playing uh, Kill Bill and Quentin and I were standing there talking and the scene with Gogo -Go comes up and the whole spinning, the spike ball, and the fight between uh, Uma and Gogo. -Go. <laughs> Quentin couldn't take his eyes off of it. And I said to him, how many times have you seen this scene? And he said, I don't care. He said, it's the best thing I've ever done in my life. And the fact that he was riveted to the screen, uh, it, was it was astonishing to me to watch him watching his work and still just be staring at it in, in this proud um, father sort of scenario. So I went to go visit him on the set of Kill Bill and he just looked, he looked beat. I mean, he was just really, it was a long shoot. I mean, well, of course, they split it into two movies. It was a, it was a long, it wasn't one movie, it was a saga. He didn't realize he was making a saga that was going to be split into two full saga-length movies. And I said, have you been to the editing room? And he said, no, I haven't, I, haven't, I don't want to watch anything until I'm done shooting. So he said, it's like, can, I, can I go see? I want to go see what, what you're doing. So I said, yeah, you go see, you go see for me. And I went, and Sally was in there. Sally was all excited. She goes, yeah, he won't come into the edit room. He wants to wait till he's done. And so I watched some of the stuff, and it was amazing. And so I went back, and I said, you've got to go into the edit room. You owe it to yourself to go see what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You're working on a classic. Cut together some footage, show it to your crew. They will go apeshit, and it's going to give them new life to finish this movie. When they see that that's what they're working on, it will give them a whole new sense of energy. I, mean, I remind them that's what we used to do on our movies. And Dustal Dawn, we showed a trailer the first week so that the crew knew they were working on a movie that was going to stand the test of time. So um, he went, he was so tired, I guess, he just succumbed, went, checked it out, got really excited, cut something, showed it to the crew. I remember coming back to visit and Stevie J was walking around with a spring in his step and going, I'm so pumped. And you know that the schedule that seemed like so long now seemed very short. Now they knew that they were on a mission to finish this movie. And, um, and I guess that really affected him because when I was watching the movie credits at the end of Kill Bill, it says at the end, special thanks to my brother Robert because I think that's what helped get him through that movie because it was a, that was a, I don't know how he did it. It's just, what a, what a job that is. It's just, it was a huge amount of Herculean effort to make that movie. Well, he, he has such a naturally collaborative spirit. You know, e even the idea that him and Rodriguez relish in working together. Um, they're so dramatically different filmmakers, it's, it's astounding that they could even coexist in the same world, but they do. We would be bouncing around and, yeah, I'll do music for Kill Bill 2, and you come direct a little sequence in Sin City. I mean, that's what we would have done in high school. We would have been helping each other out. Um, not just to get the help of that person, but to also get just the, the juice and the, the, you know, the excitement that comes from it, just the, that abundance, overabundance of creativity that happens when you get people in the room. I have it on tape somewhere. I, have, I, I let the camera roll in the room when, when Quentin came in the morning of the shoot for Sin City, and he brought his take of what he was going to do with the material. Um, because it was genius. And it was so simple. It was, it was genius and simple. He just said, your whole movie's voiceover, I don't want to do that in post because I'm only here one day. So I think if we can get the actor to do it, he should say his voiceover out loud. It should be a monologue that he delivers because he's talking to himself anyway. So rather than be a voiceover that we record later, some later date, make that guy <laughs> Clive Owen, who fortunately was a brilliant actor, and Quentin gave, I saw Quentin give him the confidence to be able to 
nail that speech on the day. You know, you know this voiceover you're going to do months from now, now you're doing it right now on camera in the next 10 minutes. Can you memorize it? When we did Grindhouse, I remember there being a T-shirt that was given out that one quote was was from Robert about, you know, get that old fucking camera off my set. And then underneath it, Quentin saying, get that digital shit out of here. And like they were sort of having these little sort of uh, fun ribbing at each other about technical versus uh, the way people people work. But, you know, the common denominator is they just love it. They love what they do. The idea was to go to Austin and the two of them to make these movies and go back to back and make these 60 minute movies and for us to use all of Robert's crew and to shoot down at Troublemaker and just be in Austin and have fun and like just, you know, bang it out. And Quentin and Zoe really connected on Kill Bill and he basically wrote Death Proof for her and he wanted to just make this fun little movie and he did. I mean, we shot it to look not great. Um, you know, we had all these cute little girls down there. Like, it was just supposed to be a fun little thing for him and Robert to do, and that's what it was. Quentin is is a genius at at holding tension. Um, I mean, in Inglorious, I mean, those that that first the way it opens. I mean, that's really basically two guys at a table, and I'm like this the whole time, um, and I remember. I remember when I read it, I was like that, but when I saw it, it was about a hundred times worse. And um, that's, that's, that's more nerve wracking than people blowing up crap and shooting each other ever is. Um, as is the, the other long scene um, in, the, in the basement of the restaurant, um, which I remember watching a 35 minute version of, and it was fine. I had no, I wouldn't have, done anything with it and they still compressed it mm -hmm. um, probably because no one would believe that one scene could be that long there's a special rung in hell reserved for people who waste good scotch seeing as I may be rapping on the door momentarily I must say damn good stuff sir about this pickle we find ourselves in. It would appear there's only one thing left for you to do. And what would that be? Stiglitz. See how feed us into your Nazi boss. He's doing the things that only he wants to see. He's not doing them for a result. And that's why they're successful, and that's why they have lasting impact. Because he makes them for his theater. He makes them for himself. And if other people like what he likes, they'll love it. And most people like what he likes because <laughs> they all love his movies. And he just does what he does. He doesn't think about the ramifications of everything other than the ramifications to him and his story sense. Mm -hmm. Not to pander to an audience or he'll do in Pulp Fiction that she draws a square or it says two minutes later and that doesn't appear anywhere else in the movie. The fuck is this place? This is Jack Rabbit Slims. An Elvis man should love it. Come on, man, let's go get a steak. You can get a steak here, Daddy-o. Don't be a... Oh, after you, kitty cat. And that idiosyncratic, I'll do what I want thing, the freshness and distinction of it and lack of formula is what makes it so appealing. His vision has never wavered. It really hasn't. He's made the movies that he has wanted to make all of his career. And you know what? He doesn't churn a movie out every three months. He crafts them. He protects them. He nurtures them. He takes heat for them. And he defends them. I love the fact that he has never sold out. Uh, he really loves what he does and that he protects his movies. And the stories that he tells, they're, they're controversial and they're raw and they're visceral and they're violent, but they're so mesmerizing and captivating that you can't take your eyes off of them. He's one of the two or three filmmakers that I will go and see everything he does as soon as I can. And uh, actually, I remember he, he called me up to see Kill Bill, part one. 
He said, come on, I'm gonna screen it, let's come to screening in New York City. And we went to the screening and he sat next to me. And while I was watching, he was like, <laughs> he was, <laughs> he was, he was getting into the movie and saying, hey, look, like talking to me through the movie. And he's only making movies for, for, for a small part of his life. The rest of the time, he's your friend Quentin. He's your brother Quentin. I go hang out with Quentin. He goes off to shoot a movie. I don't see him for eight months, sometimes a year. He comes back. I watch the movie, and I'm like, y and you forget. You forget he's Superman. You forget that he's not Clark Kent. You forget, oh, my God, I forgot. I forgot you're that guy who makes these movies. How did you How did you do that? And you know him, and you've seen him do it, but you still can't believe the result. You look at the result, and you, it's almost like you're, you're looking at somebody else. Mm -hmm. That's a, still such a great feeling to get. When I finish watching Glorious Bastards, when I've seen stuff from, from Django, I'm like, how did you do that? <laughs> when I saw Kill Bill 2, I said, how did... How did, you, how did you do that movie? And he goes, oh, come on, you know how I did it. I go, yeah, but I don't know how you did that. I don't know how you shot that thing. That's impossible. I never could have done that. I never could have done that in a million years. How long were you shooting? He told me how long he was shooting. I, said, I, I couldn't have done that. Could not have done it. I don't know how you did it. It's amazing when somebody you know so well can still surprise the hell out of you. And that's what he is. I mean, he's, he's, he's amazing. He's just amazing. He pushed the boundaries of, of genre and storytelling a narrative structure and a certain kind of energy and tone and a way to tell a story that was so completely Quentin. I mean, if you look at sort of who are the masters of cinema in the 20th and 21st century, Quentin will stand tall in that group. What's interesting about Quentin's fame is that it is entirely from his talent and his gift and his passion for, for film. And that is very rare in our society. He's famous for his achievement as an accomplishment and his, and his talent. And uh, that's a real unique, special fame, I think. Deserved. You can look at movies before Quentin Tarantino and movies after. He's that much of a pivotal figure in world cinema. The unsung hero, you know, he has a very humble beginning of being a fan of film. And the fan of film becomes a master filmmaker. The best thing that I could say, I'll take a title of his film and say that he's injected into the process of a filmmaking, pulp fiction. The mosaic of your whole career is viewed at one point, but in the moment to moment uh, measurement of your career, you're delivering each new thing. And some people are, uh, might be surprised, some people might ex expect only great things from you, but there's always this pressure to deliver a good show. And that's okay. That's what we're here for, to deliver a good show. And he can do it um, better than anyone. <laughs> and he just loves what he does. And that is part of it. I mean, you're putting on a show. You're putting on a show and you roll cameras while you're putting on the show. So he's the best showman there is.